100 days. My name is Ryan Swan, and I am California representative on the Green Party Peace Action Committee. I want to briefly comment on the timeliness of the topic of tonight's webinar. Much of the world, and indeed much of the country, have breathed a collective sigh of relief with the departure of the Trump administration and the advent of the Biden administration. But closer inspection, particularly in the foreign policy sphere, uh, yields, uh, reveals little change in, in many respects. And indeed, what changes there have been, uh, many of those have not been in a more peaceful, less aggressive direction. Tonight's lineup of speakers will address particular aspects of Biden's foreign policy and shed more light on the agenda, foreign policy agenda of this new administration. As Greens, we're, we think it's particularly important for those who supported the Biden administration to understand what it is, in fact, that they are supporting. So before I introduce the speakers, I want to briefly set forth the structure for tonight's event. Each speaker will have approximately 15 minutes to deliver remarks on a particular aspect of Biden administration foreign policy. After the conclusion of speaker presentations, we will have a question and answer period. Uh, those who are registered for the chat, or those who are registered for our Zoom stream will have the opportunity to post questions in the chat. I will field those and present them to the speakers. Uh, we have approximately an hour and a half for tonight's presentation, for tonight's event. Um, as long as we are receiving fruitful questions, we will use that full period. Uh, to the extent uh, we do not, I will end the meeting a little bit early. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Matthew Ho, who will, from the Center for International Policy, who will address active war. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure uh, to do this with the Green Party. Um, you know, I, I think you get, I get asked this question quite a bit about what is Biden's, um, what is his foreign policy, his military uh, policy, his wars going to look like, um, particularly uh, compared to Trump, Obama, Bush, et cetera. And I don't think there's really much of a difference. I think what you've seen is a continuation um, of an evolving policy uh, that really begins in the 90s. Um, after the Cold War ends, um, that then kind of gets um, off track, if you will, uh, by the post 9-11 wars. Uh, and this is something you'd hear quite a lot in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Pentagon, um, at the State Department, et cetera, this idea that these wars are kind of an aberration to what the actual policy is supposed to be that these wars have become a sideshow, that these wars are basically um, not allowing the empire to continue in an evolving manner that is best for the United States, best for the Pentagon, best for uh, the ambitions uh, of those. Um, so what we're seeing, I think, with the drawdown in Afghanistan uh, by the Biden administration is a... is um, aligning that war with the other wars, uh, aligning that war with the wishes and the intentions of the Pentagon. Um, again, these that go back to the 1990s. Um, so what you see with the Afghan war, as the acknowledged U.S. forces come out of Afghanistan, leaving the unacknowledged U.S. forces, which will be thousands of special operations forces, CIA personnel, contractors, plus proxy forces, that aligns the Afghan war with the wars in the Muslim world that the U.S. is waging that go from Western Africa all the way to Pakistan. And so what you, you see here is you see this form of warfare that the Pentagon 
intends to wage and has been waging, um, that it lost its ability to control the nature of the warfare, how it wanted to fight, what it, how it wanted to occupy, how it wanted to control by the Bush administration because of their wars uh, in uh in Iraq and then to another extent by the Obama administration's surge in Afghanistan. But what you see, particularly beginning under the Obama administration, as um, the policy starts to uh, get more in line with what the Pentagon um, and all, when I say the Pentagon, I, I include all its supplicants, all its, it, that include the defense industry, all the think tanks that are funded by the defense industry, okay, the, the neoconservative and, and, and neoliberal uh, uh, humanitarian interventionists within the Democratic and Republican parties, all these people who have this um, who tend to think of themselves as thinkers or strategists, uh, or you know, they represent the thought of the defense industry and the Pentagon. Um, but what it does is it gets the, it, what we're seeing is Afghanistan getting in line with these other wars um, that are being waged again throughout the Muslim world. Um, and that are basically proxy wars, uh, wars that um, involve very little acknowledged US presence on the ground, um, typically, it's American forces that are relatively small in numbers, certainly not like the 100,000 American troops that Obama had in Afghanistan, the 150,000 American troops that Bush had in Iraq. You're talking about thousands of, of individuals spread across many countries um, who are there primarily to do two things. One, to train local forces, proxy forces, uh, to assist them. And secondly, uh, to do specialized work, uh, kick in doors and shoot people in the head, basically, is, is how they define specialized work. Uh, and that's where you see the special operations commandos and the CIA commandos who are, uh, you know, located again throughout that whole region. Um, but primarily what is being used is these proxy forces uh, that can be in some countries, uh, they are government forces, uh, like say in Afghanistan, uh, it's, it's the Afghan army, Afghan uh, NDS intelligence service, Afghan uh, police, uh, they are um, sectarian forces, uh, such as what you would see in Syria with the use of the Kurdish forces, the, uh, the SDF, uh, to fight the Islamic State and to serve as a wedge against Assad's uh, government. Um, and, you know, oftentimes these are sectarian forces too. This is this goes back to the American use of divide and conquer, something the United States government has utilized since its foundation, before its foundation, you know, uh, trying to divide and conquer the Native American tribes and communities. And that has something that was utilized, of course, you know, all throughout the, the, the 19th century, uh, through the 20th century, you know, look, you look throughout um, really any conflict the United States military was involved in that would be considered uh, not, uh, you know, World War One, World War Two, but the smaller wars in, in Central America, the, the, the wars in, in, in Southeast Asia, et cetera, where uh, one side was tried to be played off against the other. Uh, and you certainly, I think, you see this most spectacularly, of course, in the invasion of Iraq in 2003, where uh, the United States pits the Sunnis versus the Shias. Uh, and of course, everyone's familiar with how tragic and catastrophic that, that became. But that is certainly what has been utilized. That's used all throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East, throughout uh, you know Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, et cetera, this divide and conquer. So you use proxy forces to do use most of the ground, most of your fighting on the ground, control the terrain. You have your special operations troops, uh, again, to help kick in doors, to help train these proxy forces. And then you have um, fire support. You have mass, massive air power uh, that comes in the form of whether it's it's manned aircraft or you know as we increasingly see uh, drone aircraft, um, and that's basically the way of war that is fitting to these what you know the Pentagon. Um, what a guy like General Jim Mattis, uh, who was Trump's Secretary of Defense, um, what he would describe and he had and he did describe as border wars, as, as you know, this idea that we are somehow as being an empire, we're going to have these borderlands that we're going to have to control. And so by using um, these proxy forces, by using um, a, a unacknowledged covert American forces and uh, firepower that is basically untouchable. And if it is touched, it's a drone. So it doesn't, you know, it, it, and one of the, we can get into this later. One of the fascinating things about the drone warfare is that the entire thing is classified. 
So it's not even like if, if, if a drone gets shot down someplace, there is no responsibility for the Pentagon to ever talk about it. In fact, that would be against the law to talk about such an action, where if a manned aircraft gets shot down, there's no such cover for that. So it's, it's quite fascinating how these very hot, kinetic, terrible wars that are killing, uh, it, it killing, wounding, displacing millions of people, again, from Western Africa to Pakistan, are basically unacknowledged, are, are by law secret wars. Um, where this then transitions to something I think that everyone needs to be aware of is how this allows everyone in the Pentagon to get what they want. And I don't think I have enough time to go back into the evolution of this, how this begins in the 90s. But certainly if you think back to when, say, Bush comes into office and before the 9-11 attacks and how Bush was saying, remember when he campaigned, he said, we're not going to do nation building. Uh, Condi Rice, when she was asked about Al Qaeda and everything, you know, said, oh, no, our, our emphasis is China. You know, Donald Rumsfeld had his whole plan to transform the Pentagon. This is all a continuation of that. That doesn't get its feet back underneath it until the Obama administration comes on. And, you know, you see Obama surge in Afghanistan, try and save face, right? Try and try and, and show that you fought the good fight, give it a decent interval and then then uh, withdraw. And then you have, of course, as everyone's aware, the, it pivot to Asia that Obama begins in 2012, 2013 or so. But what this does is it allows for those components of the Pentagon to get what they want. So you have the secret warriors. They've got their wars throughout the world. But now the army gets to have its war in Europe. It gets to have its land war, right? It gets to have focused on Russia. And this allows the army to have its armored division. It allows for new tanks, new artillery pieces, right? It allows for generals to be the kind of generals they want to be, that, that they imagine they can become. They can become the next Patton, right? They can become the next Eisenhower. You know, they don't want to, they saw what the results are for generals in these wars. They don't want anything to do with that, really. So there's a lot of reasons, you know, of course, there's money behind it, uh, right? Because this is how you uh, are able to justify new tanks, attack helicopters, uh, artillery pieces, et cetera, if you're going to have a war with Russia. Uh, it allows, again, for the armored formations, the bases, you know, that allows for the big army to be happy, basically. And it allows for these generals to imagine that they're going to have a legacy uh, that is more in line with traditional army legacy. The same can be said of the Navy and the Air Force, where the Navy and the Air Force now can focus on China. They don't have to worry about their B1s and their uh, and their carrier battle groups being taken up with rotations off the, you know, in the Persian Gulf, uh, off the uh, uh, in the Arabian Sea, in the Indian Ocean, right, to take care of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, that kind of stuff. They can focus on China. Because again, that's the same type of thing with China, right? This is what allows them to become the next Nimitz or Leahy or uh, God help us, Curtis LeMay. Right. Um, this allows uh, uh, this. This this is what justifies half billion dollar bomber planes, 13 billion dollar aircraft carriers. Right. Eight billion dollar submarines. So I, I think as we move forward and I'll wrap it up here, as we move forward, we want to um, look at this uh evolution of American policy, understand where it comes from, how this came from out of thinking uh, post-Cold War, but also too um, how it benefits everyone within the uh, defense you know, establishment, that $1 trillion a year Leviathan. How does this change in footing for American forces, this assignment of who the threats are to the United States? And I put threats in quotes because uh, you know, I don't believe that they're, they're threats. Uh, they're, they're, they're certainly threats of our own making, right? They're, they're, we, are, we are creating our own reality here. And when I say we, I mean the United States, certainly not the folks on this, this uh, discussion. But uh, we are creating our own reality in terms of making these threats, which then justifies all the weapons programs, justifies the bases justifies the policies. It allows these men, these men and women who are in the Pentagon to think of themselves and advocate for themselves as next generation of warfare uh, thinkers, right, as strategists. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it, I think it's interesting and it's, 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 it's in many ways um, appropriate that Afghanistan is the last of the 15 or 16 different wars that the United States is, is currently engaged in throughout the Muslim world to transition uh, to this uh, unacknowledged proxy uh, drone-based form of warfare. Um, and uh, 
and also too, it is again to leave in the fact that just to people to think about how everyone gets what they want out of this in terms of the defense industry, the think tanks, the generals, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing my uh, colleagues and uh, to your questions later. Thank you so much, Matthew. Very interesting. And I think we see through this history, going back to the, the end of the Cold War, that this agenda that you talk about is very much bipartisan in nature. I want to point that out. So we're going to transition to our next speaker, Julie Varighese from the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network. And she will talk about Cold War and the uh, rejuvenation of a new Cold War. So with that, Julie, the floor is yours. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for inviting me onto uh, this webinar. Um, again, as Ryan introduced me, I'm the coordinator of the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network, which is for non-African allies to support the Black Alliance for Peace. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about the so-called uh, new Cold War. And um, I just am noticing I'm not spotlighted. I'll spotlight myself. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the so-called new Cold War against China. So first, um, if anyone remembered that big pool party that happened last year in China, in fact, it happened in Wuhan, which was the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, if people remember, it was a concert and people were jumping up and down and dancing in a pool side by side no social distancing, no physical distancing, and certainly no masks. How can that be? It's because China effectively managed the COVID-19 situation through state action coupled with public action. And I assert that that's at the heart of the United States' hybrid war against China, that China could manage to beat back a virus and then be the only country to experience economic growth in a year every other country was suffering that's the issue. The so-called elite countries that make up the G7 are not so elite and not doing so well. Journalist Martin Jacques called it, uh, said that, you know, these are global, supposedly global leaders, but now they've just been, they've come down to just be, being merely an ideological sect, which is anti-China. And that's, except, that's essentially what they aim to do is to take down China. But that seems to only apply to the United States other member states of the G7 don't want to break it off with China, especially seeing that, you know, for example, ger many German companies have factories ringing the Chinese city of Wuhan. Why would Germany or Italy or France or J Japan want to break it off with China when they're having it so good? The West is divided and the United States is in decline and the United States now can no longer get its way like it used to. So propaganda works really well. People who normally cannot stand Trump still repeat his talking points about COVID-19 being the China virus or the Wuhan virus or a Kung flu. And uh, Biden has fallen right in line with all that Trump has been, had been saying in attacking China and even going so far as to say China was hiding information despite the World Health Organization, whatever you think about the WHO, the WHO applauded China for investigating the origins of COVID-19 in that country. And Biden's also been repeating Steve Bannon's talking point about a lab leak and using that to ramp up the war against China. An article in the New York Times recently exposed that the US military leadership was pressing US President Eisenhower back in 1958 to bomb Chinese cities at the behest of the Kuomintang. A, the Kuomintang were the uh, Chinese nationalists that the Chinese communists had driven out of the country back in 1949. The accusation now is that China is, uh, is practicing so-called mercantilism, meaning that it's focusing too much on trying to develop its own country instead of trying to keep the cost of labor in China low enough so that US and other Western powers can profit as much as possible. Uh, but in this case, the mercantilism, they're focusing their criticism on China's 
rail infrastructure with its high speed trains. China has 146,000 miles of railways and 23,000 miles of just for high speed rail. And these trains can go into mountainous remote terrain in China. As my comrade Danny Haifang of the Black Agenda Report mentioned, it's uh, the, what the United States is basically doing is quote, trying to say that it's a high crime against the free market is what China is doing as though it's like this big offense against the rest of the world or really against the United States. In fact, the war against China had for a while before Biden came into office, it had been, it had been portrayed as a tech war where the United States and its allies needed to supposedly guard against the guard against China tracking and surveilling people in the West who used Huawei phones. Now, Huawei at one point was a public project in China, and it's now a private company. So why would a private company be tracking and surveilling people in the West? Well, it turns out actually that the NSA is the biggest spy agency in the world, and the NSA is the national security agency for the United States. That means that the United States is the biggest spy in the world, not China. And we have Edward Snowden to thank for revealing that information. Now, there's an interesting turn of events because like Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton is a transatlanticist, meaning that she uh, aligns with the kind of liberal class of people in Europe across the, across the Atlantic Ocean who uh, tend to use neoliberal austerity to kind of uh, keep uh, the situation under control or, or derive more and more profits for the elites as capitalism devolves. And uh, besides being a transatlanticist though, she also sounds like she might be a communist. Why do I say that? Because recently she encouraged the United States and its allied states in Europe to quote, take back the means of production. That sounds like she's using uh, revolutionary terms. So it's almost like as revolutionaries, we need to really get sharp in how we come up with our slogans so that they can't be co-opted. And uh, But what ba Danny Haifang also mentioned in, in his analysis is that the war in China will involve building up U.S. infrastructure, but it's going to come at a cost to the United States, to the actual people in the United States. It will involve tax incentives, which means uh, plopping down more money to pay workers. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it'll involve tax incentives as Hillary Clinton suggested. But the thing is that she recognized that you can't get US companies just give more money to pay workers in the United States unless there is an incentive. But what do these tax incentives mean? It usually means austerity for the people in the form of crumbling roads, crumbling schools and lack of health care. So this war in China turns out to be a war on humanity. A think tank called the International Technology Innovation Forum called for sanctions on China for its so-called mercantilism, uh, even suggesting that the World Bank should take back funds that China had requested for its high-speed rail system. I, I need to note though that the International Technology Innovation Forum is funded by corporations like Walmart and Amazon, but also technology and defense firms like Northrop Grumman and Boeing. It's also funded by the Australia Strategic Policy Institute, which had released those bogus satellite photos of Uyghur concentration camps. Now, the issue of Uyghurs is interesting, too, because China has been at the forefront of stopping terrorism in Central Asia. Why is that? Some extremist elements have been attempting to turn the autonomous region province of Xinjiang into East Turkestan. Even before the 9-11 attacks in 2001, China and Russia had kickstarted the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was at first made up of just a few countries in Central Asia, plus China and Russia. The goal of the SCO was to beat back radical Islamism, meaning that kind of perverted form of Islam that was then deployed to uh, rally certain people who were already um, deprived of uh, opportunities to live their best lives because the economies in their countries were so terrible for even for a very educated people. So the uh, this Islamism was, was in the region and it was threatening everybody in the Asian continent from the West all the way to the East. So China ended up 
leading that process before 9-11 even started. And then, and even now, China's also leading the trilateral process currently involving Afghanistan, Pakistan, and China to aid the peace process in, Af in Afghanistan to help rebuild that country and to also stop the East Turkestan Islamic movement that the United States denies exists. But why would the United States deny it? Because then it would have to admit the reason China might be de detaining and re-educating people in Xinjiang might have to do with extremist elements that are terrorizing the um, people of Xinjiang in their effort to break away from China to create their own country. Of course, the Uyghur issue ties in with, the China, with China's Belt and Road Initiative, which the United States appears to be trying to stop with its military and mercenary presence in Afghanistan. Um, I assert that the Uyghur situation, the Iraq uh, WMDs, the incubate, incubate, incubator babies in Kuwait, and the Hong Kong pro-democracy, so-called pro-democracy protesters, that they're all related. It really brings me now to what this new Cold War really means. I assert, as do some of my comrades, that the new Cold War or the Cold War itself does not refer to a time frame, but to an ideological conflict. It started back in 1492 when, as my comrade Adjama Baraka says that Europeans, quote, spilled out of Europe. I actually love that he says that because you can really see and understand what he means by that, that they spilled out of Europe to invade and genocide the people and beings of the so-called Americas. And that war never ended because it swept across the rest of the world with these so-called explorers looking for ways to loot places all over the world. That war is still happening today in Haiti, where the people are fighting for their right to govern themselves as imperialists uh, uh, who are trying to prop, prop up a new colonial puppet named Jovenel Moise. And uh, Jovenel Moise says that he has a right to stay in office past his term. Democrats in the United States support that. But when Trump was uh, saying he was going to stay in office past his term, Democrats were uh, in an uproar over that. Isn't that interesting? That's actually pretty ironic. So that war is happening. And also, you know, in Bolivia, there was a, a coup that happened in 2019. Right wingers were backed by the United States trying to take over the government and they took it over for uh, almost a year. And again, in China, the Belt and Road Initiative, it's not just an economic project. It's an anti-colonial expression. It, people remember China was colonized by Europeans and this project, this Belt and Road Initiative is a way for China to push back against the ways, the way things have been going in the world for the past more than 500 years. So for people like myself and for my comrades in the Black Alliance for Peace who find themselves within the Black radical tradition, war is a class issue. The elites want us to view their enemies as our enemies. They want us to sign off on their desire to do a first strike on China and Russia's nuclear launchers. We say no way. We as colonized and oppressed people, working class people, poor people, we view China and Russia way differently and we have a right to and we're gonna assert that right to view China and Russia differently. So it's not a cold war then, it's a war of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy against communist movements, against national liberation movements, and essentially against collective humanity. Once we've correctly determined who the enemy is, then we'll be able to effectively organize, and that's when we'll win. And with that, thank you so much for your time. Julie, thank you so much for your comments. Really helpful to place these current instances of competitiveness and US aggression in a much broader context going all the way back to 1492 as you did. So thank you so much for that. We're now going to shift gears a little bit to economic warfare and economic aggression. And I am going to turn over the, hand over the baton to Stansfield Smith, who's an independent journalist with publications in a variety of impressive public fora, including Counterpunch, Monthly Review, The Gray Zone, and so on. So with, Stan, uh, with that, Stansfield, please. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on this show. I'm a lo loyal voter for the Greens ever since uh, the notorious 2000 election. Um, 
I'll talk mostly about, because I mostly work on uh, solidarity with the Latin American countries of Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and also Bolivia. I'll mostly focus on effective sanctions and economic warfare on these countries. But um, what the U.S. has to do first in uh, putting sanctions on a country is they have to say that the country is a extraordinary threat to our national security of the United States. Now, uh, United States declared in 2018 that Nicaragua was an extraordinary threat to our national security. So I don't know if you've noticed uh, any extraordinary threats coming from Nicaragua in the last three years, but that's the, we're supposed to believe that. Um, Venezuela has been an extraordinary threat to our national security since 2014, right after uh, Obama recognized Cuba, he said, oh, now it's Venezuela that's the extraordinary threat. You may wonder of all the threats, the all extraordinary threats that we face in the in US today, how many of these are caused by Nicaragua or Venezuela. You, Cuba's been uh, on this extraordinary threat list since 1976 when they started this national emergency laws, even though blockade in Cuba has been going on for about 60 years. Um, and they, these extraordinary threat measures have to be renewed every year by the president. And they're supposed to be, supposed to go to Congress and get some approval for renewing it. So you think they maybe sometime they would want to present some evidence of any kind of extraordinary threat, but they don't bother. Given that it, they declared it, some country an extraordinary threat, then the U.S. can say, well, we're imposing sanctions on this country to defend ourselves. Now, according to the United Nations General Assembly, the votes that they've taken, any unilateral sanctions by a country against another country is illegal in the international law. But that, that makes no difference whatsoever to the United States. Now, sanctions can be as bad as actual military invasion of a country. It is used to, uh, against any kind of country that chooses to develop a path, a an, an, uh, political and economic path independent in any way of the United States. And the U.S. can impose sanctions that can block all their financial and trade transactions. They can uh, block financial institutions from processing any transactions by a country. The U.S. can even freeze the assets of a country or confiscate the assets of the country like United States or Britain has done with the case of uh, Venezuelan gold, though the U.S. has done that with a lot of things from uh, Cuba over the years. Now the U.S. uses sanctions to overthrow governments that uh, do not uh, kowtow to the United States. Um, then these uh, sanctions can destroy a country as effectively as any kind of war. Like, um, good example, maybe, well, the, the ones, the countries that are most sanctioned are Iran, Syria, Cuba, North Korea, Venezuela. Those are, they have the most severe sanctions. Uh, the Center for Economic and Policy Research did a study about three years ago and said that 40,000 Venezuelans have died in the previous year and a half because of U.S. sanctions. So that was three years ago. That means 120,000 or more have died in Venezuela because of the U.S. sanctions on that country. But maybe the worst example, it comes from this book by Joy Gordon called Invisible War, the United States and the Iraq sanctions, where she said, up 660 to 850,000 Iraqi children under the age of five died because of U.S. sanctions between 1992 and 2003. Now, if you think how many Iraqis have died since 2003, 
because of the war. I think it's about a million or a million and a half. But that's in, in 20 years. And this is about 10 years. They're talking between 660 and 880,000 children just under the age of five. So you can see that sanctions can to kill as many people, if not more, than actual U.S. invasion and war. Uh, what does the U.S. do in response when the, when the United Nations General Assembly s declares that these unilateral sanctions are illegal? Well, it just ignores it. Like we know every year for the last 28 years, in, the UN General Assembly has condemned these sanctions on uh, Venice, uh, Cuba, the, the blockade of Cuba. So what does it, does it have any impact on the United States? No, today, right now, the blockade on Cuba is worse than it was 28 years ago. And Biden has kept in place every single measure that Trump added to the blockade of Cuba, which is like, 243 measures, including putting Cuba back on the state sponsor of terrorism list. So if you think about how the U.S. can just impose sanctions on any country in the world and the rest of the world says, no, you cannot do that, U.S. just ignores them, I, it's rather hard to say, you know, with what, ex, what sense is the U.S. in decline? I don't think it's... Um, I don't really think it's in decline in some ways, but its power is still overwhelming. Um, the US even, when the uh, International Criminal Court was going to investigate US war crimes in Afghanistan, US government threatened to sanction them if they tried to investigate US war crimes in Afghanistan, and they did. They, they banned, their judges on the International Criminal Court from coming to the United States. They could, they could froze their assets that were in the United States. I mean, the United States can do this to International Criminal Court and like, who does anything about it? There's nobody can do anything about it really. Um, so how does the US uh, how does the U.S. impose its sanctions on the rest of the world and makes it enforced around the world? Well, the, there's eight or nine international reserve currencies in the world. The most important are the U.S. dollar, then the euro, and the Japanese yen, the British pound, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar. Um, and if you're any country in the world and you want to trade with another country, you have to use those currencies. I mean, there's some, even like, even though China is like now the number one production center in the world where it produces its, its uh, manufacturing production is now double what the U.S. is. Still, China is, doesn't even it sells things to other countries is in dollars or euros. It's only 2% of world trade is in Chinese money. So China might be, have surpassed the US in terms of manufacturing power and exporting, but in terms of financial control of the world economy, the US still has a lock on it and can impose its will on the rest of the world. And it's, uh, it use it, one way it can do this is through the SWIFT system, which is the, um, it's the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, which anytime there's any transaction in the world that goes through any of these international reserve currencies, it goes through this system. And so the US is able to monitor every single transaction in the world. And their control of this is, is so great and they monitor it so much that I remember I read to, two years ago it was in the Toronto Star, there was one little uh, coffee truck. Uh, the family had a coffee truck 
thing in, in Toronto where they sold foreign coffees. And one of the coffees they sold was uh, Cuban coffee. And the, and the U.S. went and they found out about it. They went and froze their bank account. They took $14,000 from their bank account in Toronto and they just kept it. And they, this, these people couldn't do anything about it. Um, now, Canada has no sanctions on uh, Cuba. It is perfectly legal for Cubans to trade and sell Cuban things in Canada. But still, because the US controls the world financial system so well, so much, it can, it can still block other superpowers, or they're not, or I mean, their imperial powers from um, block them in their trading with uh, Cuba. Now in Venezuela, all these major, 90% of uh, world trade takes place in these US or European currencies. And all of them have sanctions on Venezuela. So all of them can block any kind of international trade or exchange or loan that, that Venezuela tries to make. So that just kind of excludes Venezuela from the world economic system. And if that happens to you, like you cannot sell your oil, you cannot, I mean, it causes economic disaster. And I don't know any other country that's actually had more of a, um, more of an economic disaster than by sanctions than, uh, than um, Venezuela. Now the the uh, the other the other system that the U.S. has it, that uses to enforce sanctions on the rest of the world is this chip system, which is like the fifty leading banks in the world that all must have offices in the United States, and so it doesn't matter if banks are belong in another country or not, they have to obey U.S. laws about sanctions, and there's. Otherwise, they just get removed from the system. Now, to take it, to show you the, the problem that places like Latin America face is that 90%, 97% of the exports in Latin America are made in US dollars, and 90% of the imports that the Latin American countries make are priced in US dollars. And even though China makes up trades half as much as United States in Latin America, all their trade is gonna be in dollars. China is kind of stuck in this system. They're trying to get out of this system so they get out of this SWIFT system so they don't get sanctioned. It's not very easy to do. Besides having this uh, CHIPS, which means the um, Clearinghouse International interbank payment system and this other one, Society for Worldwide Internet, Interbank Financial Transactions, Telecommunication, the US also controls the World Bank and the IMF. Is my, um, so it can in, it block loans to uh, whatever country it wants. The US also can, is in controlling power in the World Trade Organization. So if country like um, Venezuela wants to take U.S. to the World Trade Organization to complain about the sanctions, like, well, the U.S. runs it. So forget it. You're not going to get your case heard. Um, <clears throat> another thing that the U.S. does, like in case of Cuba, where European countries, so they have businesses that trade with Cuba, the U.S. tells countries, well, if you want to trade with Cuba, go ahead, but you're blocked out of the uh, US market, which US market is 25% of the world consumer market is the US market. So, you know, companies are not going to give up the US market to trade with Cuba or with Venezuela. It also, US also enforces its sanctions by, uh, in its blockades by fining foreign banks for 
not following the U.S. blockade, which I mean, in all their countries, doing banking or trade with Cuba is perfectly legal business. But U.S. can go to other countries and because of its control of the world banking system, it can impose its work will on foreign countries and foreign banks and foreign corporations. I remember it took some information from a couple of years ago that in April 2019, this British bank, it's not a U.S. bank, and Britain has normal relations with Cuba. Their standard charter bank agreed to pay $1.1 billion for violating the Cuba blockade. And that's nothing they did in the United States. It's all outside of US law. US is just going over there and you pay $1.1 billion or you're going to be, we lock you out of the US market. In 2016, they, they US fined this Societe Generale. One, uh, the French company bank, $1.34 billion for violating the US blockade. <clears throat> and the biggest fine was under Obama in 2014 where the Paris National Bank Paribus was agreed to pay a fine of $8.1 billion for violating the US blockade of, of Cuba. In all these countries, there's no blockade of Cuba. That's just three banks I named. That's $10 billion in fines that they paid. But they didn't legally, they didn't have to, but the US gives them a choice. You pay or you're not going to be in the US market. So up to you what you want to do. So that's another way they can US can threaten, impose its will on the rest of the world by this its financial controls. Um, but to put this in some kind of historic context, like Julie was a little, when, you, when the European powers invaded the rest of the world, these lands where the people were basically self-sufficient and they had their own political and social systems and their own economic systems. And they were doing, you know, India and China were more developed than uh, Europe at the time. But when the Europeans invaded those countries, they basically destroyed their economies and rebuilt them to service the, service the European economies. And that's what happened for you know, 300 to 500 years, depending on when they became independent. Their whole economic system was rebuilt to service Europe. And after like 300 or 500 years of, of having economic and political system like that, they became independent. But still, their whole economy has been geared towards serving uh, the economic needs of Europe. And it, for them to do trade, for example, they need to get monies from the United States or Europe. And all these countries now, most of them, the US and European countries made sure that they're not, don't have food sovereignty and they don't have uh, energy sovereignty. And so they make them, so they're, We'll make, you can be independent, but you're gonna be dependent upon us economically forever. And that is something that all these countries, uh, because of that, they are in a very weak position to combat any kind of sanctions that the US puts on them. Because the US can just like, we shut down your access to dollars or euros. We shut down your access to food. And, and energy then you know be wait a little bit and we can overthrow your government and when i was reading about some of this this mmt economist fadel kaboob said over the last few decades the western countries have taken 600 billion dollars every year from the third world from their system they have set up to exploit them even because all these <clears throat> now to talk about uh how us is interfering in these uh, latin american countries or i'll just talk about cuba and nicaragua and venezuela for a minute since we're supposed to see how have things have improved under uh biden um 
and Ven and Nick. Stan, Stan, if I may, just if we could uh, take two two minutes and then wrap Probably. up, if that's okay. Thanks a lot. Um, basic right now in Congress is is the Reina Ser bill to uh, start imposing bigger sanctions on Nicaragua because there's an election this year and the Sandinistas are going to win and the U.S. doesn't want that to happen. And they, they've spent millions of dollars funding the opposition there, which is what the U.S. does all the time. They, they, uh, Biden has also spent $20 million just this year funding uh, right-wing uh, counter-revolutionary groups in Cuba and $50 million this year on the same kind of right-wing groups in Venezuela. So Biden is continuing Trump's policies there and it is going to get worse. All we can do is the problem is also going to get worse because if Trump did it, more people would protest. When Biden does it, they don't protest so much because they say, well, if it was Trump, it would just be worse. So, um, but I can, uh, that'll stop then now and people have questions later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dan. I think this issue of economic coercion, particularly in the unilateral context, is a fascinating and grossly under-discussed topic in, in mainstream fora. And I think it's really interesting when this coercion actually becomes a form of economic warfare. And I, I definitely have a few questions on that I'd love to get into if we have time later in the discussion. But for now, I want to transition to our final speaker and our final topic, namely cyber competition. I think this is a very interesting and also very dangerous area of, of policy in the, in the global security sphere presently. So I look forward to hearing remarks by our final speaker, Haig Hovannis, who is the serves as secretary of the Green Party Peace Action Committee. Haig, the floor is yours. I'm going to try to cover this topic with some PowerPoint slides and uh, uh, make it accessible to um, people uh, but, uh, just have a general understanding of the news and the issues. I'm going to share my screen now and uh, start with uh, the slides. So, um, warfare has been a constant in human history and uh, it has moved with uh, technology and uh, our era is no different. The uh, universally interconnected character of computers and the uh, increasingly pervasive uh, use of computers in all aspects of life has afforded opportunities for um, uh, imposing power uh, by means of attacking computer systems. And uh, these means have been exploited by criminals. And now increasingly nation states are becoming involved in um, uh, asserting their uh, national interests by means of uh, what is generally called uh, cyber warfare. So what exactly is cyber war? Software can be weaponized if it's used to inflict damage, because that's what weapons do. We use them to, we use weapons to harm people, in extreme cases to kill them, uh, to utterly destroy them. And uh, you can use software for that purpose as well. All of us in our daily lives see the increasing presence of software in our, uh, in our homes. We now, uh, stream our entertainment through software mediated devices. If you have a state of the art automobile, its uh, capabilities are updated over the air through software. Uh, 
The reason many of us were able to work effectively from home during the pandemic is because of the ingenious software uh, like Zoom that uh, enables this meeting from people who are uh, hundreds and thousands of miles apart. So software is the magical stuff that uh, enables a high-tech economy. However, uh, it also provides avenues for harmful and destructive activity. And uh, the military systems uh, are intensive users of software, command and control to target weapons, to uh, survey targets. And uh, that is why the military initially was keenly interested from a defensive point of view to make sure that their systems wouldn't be vulnerable to software attack. But of course, financial systems use software intensively. The uh, public utilities, power generation, water systems, gas distribution, pipelines, more on that in a little while. Uh, telecommunications, news networks, uh, facilities like uh, the Zoom conference, medical facilities are software intensive, and transportation, the air traffic control system, the trains, the subways, uh, all of these systems are heavily computerized and dependent on the correct functioning of their software. So why is software vulnerable? I mean, why can't we just armor plate uh, all our computers with bulletproof software? Well, the issue uh, has several parts. The, there's the intrinsic complexity of software. Uh, it's very hard to exhaustively test software. And the larger the software package, the lower the assurance that you've found every possible vulnerability. Also, uh, in the uh, history of software development, much of it came out of uh, energetic grad students and engineers who were operating in a high trust environment. They never dreamed that their creations would be uh, crawled over by mischievous hackers and opportunistic criminals and uh, aggressive uh, uh, intelligence agencies. So uh, it, it was never conceived as something that would become a battleground, but it has. Uh, commercial firms have an incentive to ship their products quickly uh, to get into the market first and to keep issuing new features to stay ahead of the competition. And software testing is an unglamorous area that doesn't attract the, the top talent. And very often uh, they say, is it good enough to ship? And out the door it goes. And then six months later, there's some uh, hack or, or crack of, of that product. Uh, the hacker community operates uh, according to perverse incentives because in the dark net, in the black market for internet goods, there are large sums paid for access to uh, critical software. And uh, there are literally thousands of very smart people searching for chinks in the armor, searching for loopholes, attack avenues, which they will then sell very often to nation states, to secret uh, intelligence services, uh, who will then use them for military purposes. And uh, and then ultimately, there are human factors. Uh, if someone clicks on a phishing email, the malware gets in the door, and it could be a nation state doing it. It could be a, a ransomware gang. Who knows? But the danger is there. In short, software all over the world is vulnerable, and it's likely to stay that way. How does it get weaponized? The picture there is the NSA's headquarters. You can uh, be sure they have a large budget and they don't disclose uh, much of anything. Uh, Edward Snowden uh, performed a great public service to the world by revealing just how uh, uh, threatening and extensive the efforts of US uh, software warriors are. Uh, they have developed elaborate toolkits for penetrating um, computer systems anywhere, anytime. And, uh, uh, this isn't limited to just stealing information. It is possible to basically set a time bomb in any computer system if you have the right tools, and it can be detonated on command or uh, by some kind of event. And you can put it in a hospital, you can put it in a power plant, you can put it in a military facility. Uh, 
uh, you can put it in a nuclear uh, fuel uh, processing center. But the problem is uh, very often these tools um, uh, are not limited to their intended uses. A malware attack uh, goes through several stages. I won't go through all these details, but basically uh, the attackers are constantly scouting and looking for vulnerable uh, computer sites. Uh, they accumulate tools that allow them to penetrate known types of operating systems or telecom software or industrial control systems. Uh, they get access sometimes through social engineering. They guess a password. They impersonate someone and get a password. They turn someone for money and get a password. Or they just uh, use a password cracking program that goes through um, thousands of common passwords. Once they get in, they implant uh, malware. It can function immediately, like take down everybody's computers and demand a million dollars in Bitcoin, or it can lie in wait. And those are the really dangerous ones because uh, it destroys trust between nations. Um, we have no idea because of the veil of secrecy around these programs, whether the US is actively implanting destructive software in Russia, in China, in other countries. Uh, we have no idea the scale of this invisible war. Uh, it's, it's kind of the counterpart of what Matthew was saying about lowering the profile of warfare so that it continues, but no one really notices. This is all deeply secret uh, activity. Um, and it would have stayed that way if Snowden hadn't uh, revealed so much. And then finally, uh, the damage is done. Um, uh, very often the destructive payload uh, uh, disrupts operations or damages equipment or uh, uh, causes untold uh, harm. Uh, the, there's a very vivid case study. Some of you may have read about this. Uh, the US did a lot of, uh, and Israel did a lot of chest thumping about slowing down the Iranian nuclear program. In 2009 and 2010, uh, using some very costly and rare uh, attack software, which was purchased by US and Israel, they were able to penetrate the uh, uranium enrichment facility at, at Natanz in Iran, and uh, very cleverly destroyed about a thousand of the centrifuges, maybe a quarter or half of the installation, by um, commanding the controllers to spin them at uh, dangerous speeds. Meanwhile, uh, showing the control room uh, uh, monitoring equipment that everything was running perfectly. So uh, the Iranians uh, took a lot of damage, but the odd thing was that this software was tailored to attack uh, a particular type of industrial controller. And it started spreading uh, because it was designed to move from uh, network to network into Europe, where some of these controllers were, were uh, in ordinary industrial uh, applications. So it was an example of a successful question mark uh, cyber attack. And the US is continuing to refine these techniques we don't know when the next one will happen or who it will be directed at, but um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very disturbing kind of clandestine warfare that's being practiced. Uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, people uh, uh, saw on the front pages that there were gas lines in the southeastern United States. The colonial pipeline was shut down because the computer network controlling it was taken down by ransomware. Uh, a ransomware uses a, a crypto locker attack where it basically uh, tar uh, strikes the target computer by um, garbling all the information and you can't unscramble it until you get the password and you have to pay for that privilege. Colonial paid uh, something over $2 million in Bitcoin to uh, unscramble their network. And uh, this could have been done by a nation state just as easily. What's interesting and what should uh, be instructive to us is that nation states and criminals are doing the same things, using the same methods and getting the same results. They're, they're destroying trust, they're uh, being hellishly disruptive and uh, 
you can't really wrap yourself in the flag and say this is a great idea when um, uh, the tools could be used uh, in a crime uh, a week later. It should be obvious uh, that there are lots and lots of uh, sites in the United States and, and all over the world that uh, can be attacked in this manner. And the internet reaches everywhere. You know, there, there are billions of nodes on the internet and uh, uh, we're moving into an era called the internet of things where just about every appliance, every vehicle, every uh, significant uh, device can have an IP address and a connection and thus become a target for a software attack. But uh, our posture uh, in, in a spooky echo of uh, nuclear deterrence is we need to be vigorous in this domain to deter other nations. So we have to have the capability to strike back or maybe even to strike first and that will keep us safe. If you live in a glass house, you shouldn't be throwing stones around. The US uh, is enormously vulnerable to cyberware attacks. We have uh, 10,000 uh, electric power plants. We have 60 nuclear plants. Uh, if a nuclear plant loses electric power for more than a day, serious things start to happen. Uh, the spent fuel in the uh, uh, storage pools, uh, if the water doesn't circulate, it starts to overheat, the water boils away, the fuel uh, breaks down and gets into the air. Uh, we are hugely vulnerable to cyber attack, and yet we are developing attack tools and threatening other nations with cyber strikes. Edward Snowden said that these things might leak out of the uh, NSA's armory, and they did. Um, a few years ago, uh, a group called Shadow Brokers uh, thought they could uh, get a ransom by putting out, um, I think it was, uh, one of, they called it a vault of uh, NSA tools. When they couldn't get the ransom, they said, okay, we're just gonna put them out on the public internet and criminals uh, scooped them up and uh, more trouble started. Snowden revealed something very interesting, which is that the NSA can put false fingerprints on one of their attacks. They can put some Cyrillic characters or some, some Chinese expressions on their software. So when the detectives investigate after the event, they'll say, oh my God, the Russians strike again. And uh, it originated in Langley. So uh, that's another disturbing aspect of this. There's no physical evidence, there's just easily alterable uh, code that uh, can uh, be used for propaganda purposes. Lately, you've been reading about hackers based in Russia. And of course, the pro propaganda halo around that is Putin's at it, Putin's at it. Well, is it, if every hacker in the US was working for Joe Biden, we could uh, say Joe Biden's at it too. And the most dangerous thing of all is conflict escalation. Skip ahead one. The nuclear systems of the United States are computer run and therefore vulnerable to software attack. If somebody disrupts the command and control of the US nuclear deterrent, that can be construed as justifying a strategic nuclear response. As a matter of fact, the recent nuclear posture review explicitly mentioned that as a case that could warrant nuclear retaliation. So you can imagine some third party, some mischief maker uh, for terrorist purposes, uh, attacking the US nuclear command and control system and kicking off a nuclear war. The most horrifying possibility. There's a screenshot here from the National Health Service, of uh, England's um, national health network that was taken down by the shadow brokers in 2016 using stolen NSA cyber attack weapons. You know, uh, we just have this notion that our intelligence services are uh, uh, these uh, super human uh, uh, high-tech uh, geniuses that um, never fail in their endeavors and uh, everything is, is up to spec. But this stuff was uh, leaked and uh, 
to this day, they don't know how much stuff Snowden took. Fortunately, Snowden did not have any malicious intentions, but they can't even keep track of, uh, uh, of uh, Snowden's uh, material. So uh, these ransomware attacks are going to be more and more widespread and often using the same tools that national security agencies have used. So when someone tells you that Russia has done something or China has done something or any country has done something, it's an agency that, uh, uh, you know, Mike Pompeo is on record as saying, we lie, we cheat, and we steal. So uh, would they tell you the truth about who conducted a cyber attack? I don't know. Uh, it's encouraging that only half of Americans consider Edward Snowden a traitor. The other half think he's a hero. I personally think he's historically a very important figure, like uh, Dan Ellsberg. So uh, propaganda Wurlitzer isn't working as well as it used to, but uh, uh, it's definitely a problem when uh, secret agencies are giving you assurances with high confidence or low confidence that something is the case. Because when you ask them for the evidence, they say, well, uh, that would reveal our secret uh, methods. We can't tell you. So in a way, this is a perfect secret storm. Uh, US militarism is still riding high, despite the military not really succeeding in anything strategically for decades. Uh, we, we still uh, uh, back the military. Uh, cyber warfare is deep secret cyber weapons are dangerous and uh, unconstrained. Um, popular culture is, is a player in this because I think uh, most people don't know that the James Bond franchise is in its 25th uh, incarnation. Uh, and uh, uh, high-tech espionage movies and, and TV series are very popular because everything works crooked clack. Everything is perfect. Nothing goes wrong for the, for the good guys because they're they're geniuses, they're masters of technology. America likes to think of itself as the world leader in uh, software and, and high tech. Uh, and yet um, the evidence is abundant that our systems are wide open to attack and we frequently stumble and can't even uh, maintain custody of our own tools. But because all this is secret, the public doesn't care. It doesn't care for two reasons. It doesn't want to learn anything about the nitty gritty of how this stuff works, and also out of sight, out of mind, and there's deep trust in the uh, spy establishment. The tech vendors uh, should have a voice in this, but they're highly dependent on government contracts and government regulation. Um, you know, Amazon is bidding for huge contracts, Microsoft cloud services bidding for huge contracts. They're not going to uh, raise uh, much of a dissenting voice. And, you know, it's their uh, software that's being compromised. For a while, there was a belief that the market in zero days should be uh, res restrained. Zero day exploits are uh, flaws in the software that not even a vendor knows about. And uh, there's been a, a kind of grudging agreement between the US intelligence agencies that they would disclose some zero days to the uh, vendor, but the ones that are really too good to let go of, they would keep. So nobody knows where that line is right now, and you can't compel these agencies to tell you. What's most worrisome is that there's no arms control framework for this activity. Uh, the Russians have uh, actually, Putin in a recent speech said, we've approached the US asking for uh, negotiations governing cyber warfare. We're not interested. Again, because we think our guys have the edge. We shall see. We have a cyber command. It is a, a kind of military branch that's affiliated with the NSA. And if you look at their doctrine, you will see that uh, they plan for attacks. We don't know how many they've done. We don't know when the next one is coming. So, the key point here is there's no technological solution. We'll never have armor-plated software. Uh, there's no way around this through a magic wand. The answer is arms control. We need treaties to ban the offensive use. We need criminal penalties for states as well as for individuals. And uh, uh, 
uh, we need international monitoring and compliance. My last slide, uh, well, one more here. These are some notable cyber attacks. You'll see half of them are criminal and half of them are nation states. Biden hasn't done anything to change things. He's slightly increased Cyber Command's budget. And this is the last slide. Uh, I think the right actions are to permanently halt all offensive cyber operations, immediately enter arms control negotiations for cyber warfare, support international monitoring and enforcement, investigate and prosecute cyber crime, whether it's a nation state or criminal gang, and most importantly, uh, international cooperation for defensive technologies. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Haig. Very comprehensive presentation on a very important issue. We've heard from four fantastic speakers, We've offered very interesting insights. Thank you to all of you. I just want to, as we've heard, diverse points made on diverse issues. I just want to try and summarize my takeaways, which are essentially that, or which is essentially that for all the feverish political divisions we see in this country, most notably between Republicans and Democrats, uh, closer inspection reveals that really both are advancing a fundamentally similar, if not essentially the same agenda, certainly in the foreign policy context. And that agenda serves elite interest sectors of the population and in many ways directly uh, poses risks and, and costs on not just the vast majority of the population in this country, but the entire world in the case of these dangerous, uh, dangerous cyber warfare, which could easily undermine strategic stability between the global powers and result in catastrophic nuclear war uh, without wishing to sound too uh, uh, dire. Th this is unfortunately a quite a realistic prospect. Um, my takeaway from all of this is that as long as we see these same decision makers, be they Republicans or Democrats in positions of power in this country, it's hard to see how we should expect different outcomes. So my big question is, how do we change the way policy is made in this country? Uh, but with that, I want to take, we've run a little bit long, I want to take about 15 minutes to have, to allow participants to offer questions. Uh, one I drew from the chat, uh, many of them were discussed um, in our lively chat, which I've been following during the speaker presentations. But one I think that's worth posing to the, the, the panel is, uh, what role does the National Endowment for, for Democracy play in US foreign policy? And I would open that to anyone on the panel and, and ask that you please restrict your response to uh, roughly a minute or two. So who would like that question? I know the... Uh, Stan, company. please. They're basically a, the modern day tool of, for the CIA. They're involved in funding the regime change opposition groups in countries like Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, Venezuela. I'm sure they're involved in the coup in the uh, Bolivia, they were or, or involved in organizing things against the government of Rafael Correa in, in uh, Ecuador, and I'm sure countries around the world I, that I, less know, I know less well, that they are there funding uh, their, uh, where's that guy from the Einstein Institute, Is, what's his name? who funded a lot of color revolutions. I'm sure that's, they exist to fund color revolutions. Thank you, Stan. Does anybody else want to offer, jump in on this question? I, I think it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of how our government works, because if it's not the NED, if it wasn't the CIA, if it wasn't the NED, if it wasn't USAID, right, a lot of, uh, uh, 
American policy is run through USAID, um, it's going to be something. And it, it really is a challenge, I think, for um, those of us who want to have a government that does well for us and for the world. How do you break apart these institutions that do such things? I mean, you take, take USAID as an example, a development arm of the U.S. government. I think most people here would like to see the world's wealthiest country do good for other countries, right? I mean, and USAID does some. They do build some wells and some other programs. But they are so have been so um, ridden through and rife with spies and with covert action and other things, just as NED has, that yeah, it's meaningless, it's purposelessness, and it makes our government even more insidious because our government can't even do, the US government can't even do something to benefit other people without poisoning it, right? It, it's, we're literally de dealing with the fruit of the poison tree here. And, and that's what you see in something like NED where there are people in NED who are not spooks, who are not spies, who are not, you know, who actually do join it because they wanna help other countries advance their governance and everything. But the problem is, how do you do that if you've, you're part of a poisoned apparatus? Um, it's, so I think it's a much better, I think you could probably, uh, Ryan, have a whole uh, webinar on that. Thank you, Matthew. I'm going to turn to another question that's just come in, which I think is an interesting one. And that is, how does the financial symbiotic relationship between the US and China come into play in these in the broader context of major power competition. So I open that to anyone who would like to take a stab at that in a one to two minute response. I'll take that. Julie, please. Uh, so um, I, uh, the uh, thing is that the United States' uh, economy is so entangled with China that talking about uh, an, a war with China, which is basically about being uh, dissatisfied with the uh, way that China has grown economically, that um, it's really hard to decouple from China because you cannot, because they make so many things over in China. like. I mean, almost everything is made in China or in some other country, but China um, makes a, a pretty large percentage of products that are um, different kinds of products for the United States. So the uh, issue is that, you know, the United States can talk about, oh, uh, it needs to, you know, stop you know, depending on China, you know, people like Hillary Clinton, other kind of ruling elites, uh, other kinds of media talking heads have lately been talking about how the United States needs to decouple and uh, create its own infrastructure to build things and create tax incentives to uh, get U.S. companies interested in uh, in building these things, uh, creating PPE, creating all kinds of things. But, but it's I think it's gonna be a lot easier said than done. And I think that they know this. So it's almost like they're just throwing anything at uh, at people now and just saying, and just um, kind of like setting it up for uh, kind of like a, a, a more, like more of like a hot kind of intervention, more of like a, a military intervention. So that's um, this idea of uh, they really, it's really hard to decouple the US from China. Thank you, Julie. Does anybody else want a stab at that? Yeah, I'll, I'll put a plug in for the work of um, Grace Blakely. She's a British uh, 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 economist and uh, uh, her latest book, The Corona Crash, has an excellent explanation of the comp uh, of what it is about China that scares the Americans so much. And, you know, if you look at the United States and just to kind of summarize the way she explains, and I thought her explanation of, of imperial capitalism was one of the best I've ever read and the clearest I've ever read. But basically you look at American history and you understand American history, the U S for how long centuries has held captive the wealth of other nations and extracted that wealth 
right? Starts off first here in this hemisphere, or is it this continent, then it expands to this hemisphere. And then particularly after World War II, the US and its allies by extension, the West, uh, the Europeans, Japan, Korea, et cetera, extract so much wealth from the poor nations, from the developing world, from the global fat South, whatever you want to call them. And now China is threatening that wealth extraction because of their competition, basically because their, their corporations there, you know, are, 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 are doing so well that that, uh, you know, criminal extraction of wealth from the poor world is what the United States and its allies are afraid of losing through competition with China. Um, and, you know, I, I thought Blakely does a really good job of explaining that. Um, and, you know, and that's not to, to depict China's motives in any ways, but more to explain the United States motives in any way, because that may not well be the motive of China. However, that is the motive of the United States. But yeah, it's called the Corona Crash by Grace Blakely. And she has a section in there and uh, I thought was really the best, clearest uh, uh, delineation of that type of capitalist imperialism and how that drives this conflict with China. Thank you, Matthew. I'll definitely check that out. And as we're running low on, on time, I just want to pose one question and give each of our speakers a chance to address it in under a minute. And that is, if you could make one policy recommendation to the Biden administration, what would it be? And Haig, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, I would say just uh, suspend unilaterally all um, aggressive cyber warfare. Uh, defense is fine to protect your systems, but to implant malware and danger uh, other nations' facilities is just looking for a disaster. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Julie, would you like to go next? Um, the, I, mean, I think that uh, eliminating sanctions all around the world by the United States would be very helpful. But the thing is that I just, I, I would have a hard time believing that, and that the Biden administration or any US presidency would do anything to, uh, stop its kind of warmongering around the world, whether it's through subversions or sanctions or military interventions, just because the primary contradiction in the world is the white supremacist colonial capitalist project. And it's brought to life by the United States and its junior partners. So um, yeah, I mean, as an internationalist, I, um, and as an anti-colonial internationalist, I would I just, uh, you know, we can, people can try, but I, it doesn't, it just doesn't seem like they're going to budge. Thanks so much, Julie. Stan. Uh, I would say what, what the United States should do is slash the military budget and use that money, which would cover getting rid of world uh, poverty and world hunger give people housing all over the world. And you can also use that money to fund uh, the fight against global warming. There's so much money spent on the military. It could be used for all these constructive things. And if we got rid of global poverty, we'd get a, little, a lot of reason that countries go to wars. Absolutely, absolutely. Matthew. I can't remember if it was uh, Chomsky or Zinn who, when he was asked uh, what he would do if he was president, he said he'd resign. Um, <laughs> so that'd be the policy recommendation I would make to them is resign. Um, but no, I agree with everything that's been said before. And uh, I don't know if there's something, I guess, that maybe you could actually get them to, to maybe latch on to. I doubt it, but would be um, this uh, new era of autonomous warfare we're going into. Uh, it is it is a it is a really a new world that is, um, you know, coupled with what Haig was talking about with the cyber stuff. <coughs> this is something that, <coughs> excuse me, I think you can make Mer American policymakers understand how dangerous that is to us. Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Autonomous war is a 
very scary phenomenon, very scary development. But this time I want to thank all of our speakers for fabulous, very thought-provoking, probative presentations tonight. I also want to thank everyone in attendance for the lively discussion that's been ongoing throughout in the chat. A video of this event tonight will be made available on the Green Party's website and also on the Green Party Peace Action Committee website. I also want to thank Michael O'Neill, our technical producer tonight, for his uh, excellent work as always. So thank you everyone and I wish you a very pleasant evening. <laughs>